in the classroom uh, is authored by Jerry Hayes. Beekeepers from across the country and really around the world send questions to Jerry. And sometimes I read these questions and I just shake my head. But to Jerry's credit, he, he answers each and every question in a very respectful way. And um, so you have a very, very special opportunity today. You don't have to send in to the American Bee Journal and wait six months to get a response from Jerry Hayes. Jerry Hayes is here today. He's here on the stage. And he brings the classroom to Sussex County. So, Jerry, one last time today. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. We had we had asked you to well, provide the questions on three by five cards. Um, we got a couple of responses. Uh, maybe I, don't know. I thought it was a good idea. Um, but and Jerry has those in his hand. He's going, to, he's going to go through these questions that he's going to answer. Thank you. Here's another one. Wow. Um, when Jerry's finished answering the questions he has in his hand, raise your hand, and Stephanie and Brian will bring you the microphone, and you can address Jerry Hayes. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Um, can, we, can we raise the lights, make it a little bit more? Unformal, and you guys are all spread out. You're like a colony dying for varroa mites. You're all. Can't, I mean, I don't mean to be presumptive here, but if we could maybe snuggle this up a little bit, that would make it more fun, I think. Come on, outliers, over here. Should I start scenting? <laughs> if, if you would go to the entrance and start fanning, that would be good. Okay, you did the best you could, so that's, that's good. That's good. All right, no, I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate this opportunity there again. Um, I get to go to a lot of meetings, and this is, this is probably one of the best meetings I've been to in quite a while. Um, super organized, super organized, which makes a big difference. You might not notice it, but I notice it, how well it's organized, uh, and of course the facility, and then Randy was great uh, today speaking, and, and so, you know, and then we had uh, Tim and, and, you know, Grant and Chris and everybody else. So anyway, it was, you have an outstanding association organization and I really want to encourage you to take advantage of, of that and, and of all the, the knowledge, skills and, uh, and abilities you have here. So this is terrific. All right, so I think I'll start from the biggest and work my way down. <laughs> For Jerry, you told us that bees treat our pollen patties as debris, tossing out 90% of them. Randy Oliver seems to claim that pollen supplements can be very beneficial at certain times. Can you please discuss this apparent discrepancy? <laughs> so, yes, for those who heard Randy talk this morning, because at certain times of the year when he wants to build bees for almond pollination and there's not enough natural pollen coming in, he uses some of the commercially available pollen substitutes. But if you remember what Randy said, and he said this twice, those only fill in the gaps for about six weeks. They're nutritionally incomplete, the stuff is still being dragged out as debris, but that 10% that's left, that the particle size is right, that the bees can consume it, the sugar that's in it, what have you, fills in some of those gaps. Those bees are having to parasitize themselves to order to gain those nu nutrients so that they can feed baby bees, feed the larva, and what have you. So yes. These things do fill gas, but being nutritionally incomplete, 
They are nutritionally incomplete, and so the bees can't utilize them without taking resources from their own bodies. And when those resources in their own bodies are diminished, the bees say to heck with it, I can't jeopardize my own health and welfare, so I'm going to stop doing this. And that's when you also saw, you know, about bees eating, eating their young uh, when nutrition gets so long. So does that make sense to anybody? Yes. Okay, all right. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, I guess. Oh, you're satisfied. <laughs> How does heating honey affect its nutritional value? Should I scrap my heated, heated knife and heated wax melter? Um, so heating generally, so, and, and maybe I hope that you all have had an opportunity to, to taste comb honey that either you've made yourself or from local or regional that's still capped, um, it contains all the flavors, uh, the aromas that originally appeared in that nectar and that was capped over and, and sealed. And it's wonderful. Comb honey is wonderful. It's, it's, it's the taste of summer. So that honey though, because of different sugar profiles, sometimes will try to balance itself because the ratios of sugars are out of proportion. And this is where granulation comes in, making creamed honey or something like that. We in this country like liquid honey, and so many of the packers and, and what have you will heat the honey up to dissolve any crystals that have already started to form in there and make it harder for the, the honey to rebalance itself. So this is a general heating of the honey. I don't think that using a heated knife or your wax melter where you're going to get a little honey out of there probably is a big deal. Um, certainly um, commercial producers of honey want their product to last as long as they can on the shelf um, and they do this but this is where I think I said this morning if you if you are entrepreneurs and you want to sell your product you have the, the skies open for selling you know this local regionally produced honey that you advertise as local regionally produced honey. Um, you, know, uh, you know, and you probably know the price of what a pound of honey is, is costing in New York City or, or other places. It's phenomenal. And I think this is a real opportunity, uh, you know, for you guys to, to either pay some of the, pay some of your expenses to, to be a good beekeeper. This is a two-parter, hang on a second here. Um, strong hive, double deep, all summer. Formic acid in late August, loaded with bees in mid-October, totally empty at Thanksgiving, absconded what happened, no dead bees. Um, let's go to the next question. <laughs> um, certainly, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, answering questions sometimes from a distance is, is difficult. Um, the bees obviously have left. Uh, they didn't like it there. He doesn't say what his mic counts were before and, and after his treatment with, with the formic. Um, when bees get sick, as you've heard several times today, uh, they are altruistic. They want to save their sisters. So they will fly out, if I feel sick, and not return. And so over a couple of weeks' time, the whole colony can disappear. That's where we started this thing with colony collapse disorder, um, that the bees simply left. They weren't dead or dying anywhere. And so. You can have, actually, Varroa under control, three mites or less per hundred. But those viruses that they may have vectored or because of their ability to cause the immune system of honeybees to collapse, allow those viruses and benign or latent viruses to reproduce, persist. And that can be a horizontal transmission. And so if you have this huge load of viruses 
generally in a colony, those bees feel sick and, and will leave. So, you know, certainly at that time of the year, under those circumstances, that's what I would vote for. Because once the hive has gotten to that, that stage, sometimes, you know, under even perfect weather conditions and everything else, it takes, and I've heard commercial beekeepers say this, it takes a year or so to get that hive back to some degree of, of health and fitness. Uh, so that they can grow and, and produce some value. So that's my answer and I'm sticking with it. How should I store my frames, comb, comb boxes while they are not being used on a hive? To avoid mold, fungus, or wax moths. Are there any special techniques? Um, yeah, other than waiting until, you know, um, pretty soon to now when your temperature drops below and it gets too cold for anything. I stack mine outside. I put the boxes at 90 degree angles so that light and air and everything else can get in there. And I've done that for years. I've done it in Missouri. I've done it in Michigan. Done it in, in Florida as well. Uh, and so if you don't have a big walk-in freezer where you're storing your deer that you killed, um, you, you got to do that. When should I insert or remove the white plastic IPM boards in the screen bottom board? Should I pull them out for ventilation in summer and insert them in cold weather? What should I do when they're not sticky anymore? Um, first, if you're using a, a sticky board, bottom boards, inserts uh, to track Varroa, you're not tracking anything about Varroa. Uh, you certainly are collecting Varroa that may fall off or die or been groomed off, but the real metric is how many mites per hundred bees do you have. A sticky bottom board thing doesn't only tell you that you have Varroa mites, it doesn't tell you how many bees are in the colony and what that ratio of mites is to be. So one, I wouldn't use that as the defining moment in how many mites you have in a colony and if you need to treat and what you need to treat on. I have had uh, screen bottom boards in my colonies for years in a variety of locations. Uh, and actually when I worked for Daydance, I, I tested them 100 years ago up in Michigan and uh, left them open all year long. Um, the, I, I think it works out pretty well. Uh, it gets not only mites, but other trash and debris out of our, our colonies. And when you think about it, our colonies are all designed wrong. You know, it's Langstroth, got this nice bottom entrance, like our bottom door on our house, nice little porch, you know, that you can go in there. Bees in the wild, when they had selected a hollow tree, a cavity, uh, they would try to select one that the entrance was above where their brood nest was going to be. One, it protected the brood nest from drafts and, and what have you, uh, and allowed this chimney effect for that warm, moist air to go out through that upper entrance. Our colonies are all basically designed incorrectly. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I have so many Lavaliers on. I have one here. I got one here. This one goes to the TSA. This one goes to. Um, yeah, that that uh, it's 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 all wrong. And but but the the screen bottom board allows that space for trash and debris to get through, uh, and also allows some ventilation to go through our hives because our hives are designed incorrectly and don't have that. don't have that upper entrance. My ears aren't big enough, or my head's too small, right? Sometimes your back, your shoulder's disrupted. Is it? Okay. You don't like that? Yeah. Okay, got it. All right, so uh, those are all the questions. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. <laughs> all right, so open it up. Um, yeah, uh, we're here all to learn together. And uh, I want us to be able to do that. So let's see what we can learn. We have one over here. Jeremy. 
Tim Shuler. I question my wife. How long have you been a beekeeper? <laughs> a few years. Okay. Uh, a question that my wife gets all the time when she's selling honey. Is this honey raw? How would you define raw honey? Yeah, that's a great question. Next question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And so my definition of, of raw honey is, is certainly you can strain it to get out the, the sticks and the leaves and, and wings and stuff. Uh, but other than that, um, I, I think it means that it hasn't been heated, uh, processed in any other way other, other than that. That would be my definition of it. And, and, and so, you know, when you're, when you're marketing, you know, local regional honey, uh, most of your customers um, are beginning to be looking for something that's, you know, raw, fresh, you know, even organic, what have you, so. Can I follow up? No. <laughs> Why is it that the average consumer thinks that raw honey is crystallized honey in the jar? Raw honey is crystallized honey in the jar? Really? It's because of the really raw honey brand in health food stores. Oh. That's why they think that. Oh. Okay. No, I, I, no, I didn't know that. So that was, that was news to me, Tim. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, sir. Or yes, somebody. Jerry, this is almost an, an attachment to Tim's question. Um, organic honey. Is there such a thing? I mean, bees fly within a three mile radius of our apiary. How could we know what they're into? Yeah, no. See no. in stores. Uh, yeah. I'll be able to make that claim. Thank you. Yeah, no, and so you're right. You know, you know there is no organic honey that I'm aware of in the United States, you know, that you can produce a, a honey crop that you would have a surplus to, to sell because of their, their foraging range. Certainly some of it is labeled that, um, you know, if it's produced in the United States, that might be, you know, something that's illegal, um, but you see a lot of stuff that comes from other countries that is labeled organic. And so they have these third party certifiers for organic everything. And um, actually there's been some concern from uh, uh, EPA and FDA lately that, uh, you know, this stuff that's labeled organic and Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and what have you really isn't. It's, it seems to be a, a manipulated term. And, and so um, there again, I th yeah, I, th I think what you produce, if you sold it, I certainly wouldn't label it organic, but I would label it, you know, local, regional, you know, something like that. Jerry, one, one quick question here. Uh, if I were a new BP and just starting out, and I came to you and said, you know, I'm going through the bee catalogs and there's a myriad of different types of hives, and sizes, eight and ten frame wood, foam, and all these kinds of things. But I said to you, what would you recommend to start with? What, what would you say to a new beekeeper? I'd say first join the New Jersey Beekeepers Association <laughs> and primarily the Sussex Beekeeper Association <laughs> and spend a year with them first. I, you know, um, the, the interesting thing is this, this huge growth in the interest uh, of beekeeping. When I started, we registered uh, beekeepers in the state of Florida when I started there. Um, because uh, honeybees are so important to Florida agriculture uh, and the uh, Department of Agriculture and the Florida State Beekeepers Association appreciated that uh, uh, connection to the Department of Agriculture and what have you. So anyway, when I started we have about 800 registered beekeepers. When I left a few years ago there were 3,000 and, and the guy who took over me, David Westervelt, says it's closer to 5,000 now. And so if you, if you duplicate that in 50 states to some way, that's huge, okay? But how many of those people are actually accessing resources like exist in this association? And so this is where I think we get a lot of confusion. Uh, we get a lot of... Uh, um, innuendo about uh, I can't keep my bees alive um, because 
In fact, I was talking to somebody earlier who said that uh, uh, when they're talking to uh, uh, when this one beekeeper um, and the bees had died, this guy asked him, I said, well, what did you use to treat for, for varroa mites? And the guy said, what are varroa mites? And so at certain percentage, that's going to happen with all the new beekeepers. And so that's a, a big concern. And so I would say, actually, I don't know if you have a mentor program. Yep. I would say if, if, if I was a new beekeeper and, and knowing probably what I know now, I would search you out and get a mentor before I even bought anything. Just because there's so much out there and there's so much confusion and bless their hearts, you know, all our vendors are there to make a buck. So if for some reason there's a blip on Kenya top bar hives, that's gonna be the best thing forever so yeah so I think a mentor and 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 uh, get somebody who knows what they're doing and I have two simple questions um, one follows up from what was discussed earlier so how, what's your definition of organic that's question number one and two I've had two completely complicated answers from a very simple question which is when the bee goes out can it go out and collect two different types of pollen or can it go out and collect pollen and nectar at the same time? So f the first question was, what's my definition of organic yeah. for honey? Any organic. Oh, any organic. So there are, if you go to the USDA website, they have um, the qualifications for you to get certified organic. And, and so those are, are all there, uh, third party certifiers. It's not somebody from the government coming out to do that. And the thing that I've always found interesting is that there's about three pages of pesticides that you can use to like grow, you know, organic lettuce or something like that. Um, and so this whole name organic, I think at least for me, has lost validity. Um, just because um, of, of all the Oh, of all the wiggle room that they've placed in this. Um, not that um, producing a crop or a product or what have you, you know, we live in a great country and we can do pretty much what we want, but I really object to selling things that are misrepresented or misadvertised. And I think that's probably what's happened to organic in a lot of ways. And, and so I think that's, that's disappointing. Uh, because you know that's that's another opportunity uh, for us to select the food we want to buy. What was the other one? Second question was uh, different types of pollen at the same. Oh same yeah. Of pollen and nectar. Yeah. So bees can collect. Generally, they like to go after one or the other. They can collect pollen and a little bit of nectar at the same time. I have never seen, and I'm going to have to ask Tim if they would collect. I've never seen bees bringing in multi, no, I, never I never have either. So I'm gonna say no. Uh, generally, they try to, to, to stick to one thing, and it's kind of interesting. Some flowers, say some flowers open in the morning, some flowers in mid-afternoon, some flowers late afternoon, and the bees make that shift to collecting those resources uh, that are different at different times of the day and pollen here is better than the nectar in the afternoon and so they're, su they're super efficient. When you there again think about this relationship between an insect and a plant and how they work together uh, to benefit each other is just incredible. Hi. Uh, earlier today you touched on this and I just wanted to get a little further clarification. You mentioned that there were bees or queens that were varroa mite aware for grooming purposes. I've, known, I've heard of a program in Rhode Island that's now breeding queens to, uh, that are varroa mite aware or, or, or their bees will actually groom the varroa mites off themselves. Can you extend further on that program or that kind of program? Well, yeah, first, First, let's talk about where Varroa comes from, from Asia, Apis serrana, cousin of our, our Apis mellifera bee. And, and that, the Varroa mite is, is a good parasite on that bee because it doesn't kill its host. 
Those bees have very small colonies, so they don't turn into varroa nurseries. Our colony, you know, varroa needs uh, developing larva, pupa, in order to reproduce and, and what have you. Uh, Apis serrana produces small colonies, maybe, you know, three, 4,000 individuals, so it doesn't have 50,000 that varroa can reproduce. Uh, it only reproduces on drone brood, the males, and the bees have a highly developed grooming strategy. They can feel the row on them and they can either self-groom or they have their sisters groom themselves and knock these things off. So all these things play into them. Our bees, of course, haven't evolved or developed in, in uh, parallel with varroa parasitizing them, so they don't have those tools highly developed. There have been uh, programs at the USDA, uh, University of Washington, uh, Sukobi, everything that has tried to, um, and Marlis Bivak up in Minnesota, develop bees that had uh, bigger hygienic um, responses, whether it's grooming or, dead gummit. I'm gonna just do this, this is stupid, okay. So, um, to have, um, grooming behavior or to recognize when there is varroa mites within a cell and they'll open the cell and then cap the cell and take out the larva pupa in there and, and disrupt that varroa mites opportunity to breed. There was a researcher in Florida, Dr. Glenn Hall, that took European bees and bred them to be almost totally resistant to varroa mites. But what happened was that you have a colony the size of a softball, which doesn't meet any of our, our goals, our standards for having this large communal population of bees. I think also Tom Seeley has found that bees that he studied in his forest region, the smaller the colony, the more able they are to have a relationship with Varroa uh, that doesn't kill them. So our big, robust colonies that we have uh, a relationship with that produce a lot of honey, uh, can do this pollination benefits, um, also our varroa nurseries, and we haven't been able to breed a bee that is able to deal with these large populations uh, and control varroa. That's not to say that we shouldn't be using some type of IPM techniques, integrated pest management of having uh, you know, varroa uh, aware bees, sensitive bees, uh, screen bottom boards, uh, using essential oils, uh, you know, maybe even drone cell foundation that you remove the drones, you know, because the varroa are still attracted to drones primarily because they have a little bit longer period to develop, so it allows the varroa to finish its developmental period. All these kind of things fit together. Uh, and I wish there was more, um, breeding programs and, and the problem is that you know it's not like you know black angus in the field we we know that black angus's genealogy all the way back because you can control the matings when a virgin goes out to mate to a drone congregation area you know she'll mate with 20 30 40 different drones the sperm stored in an organ in her body called a spermatheca and the bees are genetically not going for the genetic home run they're going for the averages so if, if, they're, if she's using sperm from one drone uh, that uh, somehow makes the bee sensitive to European fowl brood, well, you know, in, a, in an unmanaged situation, <clears throat> that's probably okay because she's gonna work her way through that sperm and get to the next drone sperm which might be resistant to European fowl brood or something else. So they have this balance and that's what allows honeybees to live basically from pole to pole is because of this genetic diversity. But this genetic diversity uh, makes researchers go crazy uh, because there is no consistency uh, among anything that you can depend on bees because we have, you know, we, they talk about, you know, Italian bees in here and Caucasian, and, you know, we have mutts. We just have mutts. And I shouldn't say this, but many queen breeders, commercial queen breeders, when a queen is produced, if it's yellow, it's Italian, and if it's dark, it's Caucasian, and if it's, you know, something else. So it's just, this is all marketing at the end of the day. That was uplifting, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, 
How relatively new? Uh, second year. Okay, all right, so you're an expert. Go ahead. <laughs> got three colonies, two of which seem to be self-regulating when it comes to feeding. Uh, if I get a few days of rain and they're trapped inside, they'll, they'll hit that syrup. Pretty hard. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and the rest of the time, they're fairly moderate. I have a third colony that will grab every ounce of syrup I get it as fast as they possibly can. In the spring, um, I get a four gallon top feeder, I'll give them two gallons and it's gone by the end of the week. Um, and so they'll just make themselves syrup bound as fast as they can. Any guidance on, right now I'm basically controlling what I feed that third hive based on the consumption of the other two hives. Yeah, and no, and, and, and that's genetic based. Um, yeah, those bees have just, yeah, uh, this, this collection and storage gene that is in gear. Um, and so where did you get your queens from? Do you know? Uh, all three came from the same source. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yes, they have their own personality and I have no way to slow them down. It's yeah, problems. yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what's the appropriate way to pace what I give them other than looking at the other two hives. And is that a good rule of thumb? Um, I, I think the rule of thumb for you right now is whatever works for you. It, it's a, I know it sounds like a, a wiggly answer, but um, if the bees are alive, um, you've treated for varroa, and they make it through winter, then whatever you're doing is okay. Well, my fear is that if I just keep feeding them, they're not going to make enough room to get into winter, so should I just stop? Well, so your goal to, to, for stored resources is generally 50, 60 pounds of, of stored stuff. So when you reach that kind of mark, I would say that might be something to consider of, of, you know, they don't need any more. But you'll certainly want to, and I keep doing this, because we want to lift the hive and see how much it weighs. Uh, but, you know, doing that through the winter to see how much they're consuming, and if you might have to supplement in order to, to keep it up. So, you know, they can not only feed themselves in winter, but the biggest resources is when you're coming out of winter and they know spring is coming and they want to build up brood and everything else. So I think that 50 pounds is your goal, regardless of how much they take down. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, my question is, these horrible hurricanes and storms that we have have got to affect the bees, the honeybees in those, in those states. Um, because historically, have bees and pollinators been able to survive those kind of destructive storms? What do you think will happen to the agriculture in those areas? And will there be more hives that will be needed to be trucked into those areas so that they'll have more food on the plate? Yeah, and so that, that's a great question. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the feral hives that did exist of honeybees don't exist anymore year round. Um, so commercial beekeepers are very successful in splitting and dividing. Um, uh, in, for instance, my days in Florida, uh, a beekeeper could take one colony and make 10 out of it. Uh, and, and so it's all weather-based and resource-based. So um, I think I would be more concerned with production agriculture uh, because of the flooding and, and things down and, and access to crop protection, fertilizers and what have you. Um, um, but I think commercial beekeepers know how to figure it out. You mentioned earlier, um, in the Mid-Atlantic region, 60 pounds is a convention for non-resources. Usually two boxes. A lot of beekeepers at this time have gotten themselves in trouble where they have more than two boxes. They might have two boxes and a honey box and they build brood in there and they have honey stored. Eventually, this is getting them in two boxes for winter. Have any suggestions for people who are in that situation where I know there's a 3 d movement in some areas of the country or whatever, but here usually it's two boxes. Manage the techniques for how do you decide how to get that back down to two boxes when you have? Something else. Yeah, and, and so I guess my question is if your goal is two boxes, it's going through the three boxes and, and figuring out where the 50 pounds of honey is and where the, the bees are and the brood and, and what have you and, and condensing them together. Um, 
uh, you know, so I don't know how much of the three boxes aren't being used if it's all filled up because you may have some extra that's going to have to be preserved over winter or you let them go with three boxes and nobody says it has to be two boxes. I'll be dead. <laughs> so in a hundred years, what am I looking for? What the beekeeping industry looks like? Yeah, and so and so that, no, that's that's a fun question to, to to think about, and everybody here chime in if if you would. One, I think it's interesting because I was before Varroa and and after Varroa. And so have seen the interest in honeybees grow because of, of people's awareness of honeybee health and how important honeybees are uh, to the environment and to agriculture and, and ultimately us individually. And so if you look at the money that's been spent on looking at honeybee health, looking at Varroa and everything else over the last 30 plus years, we're still talking about the same stuff. And that's what I don't understand. If this was chickens, and the chickens had some big mite on them that was sucking their brains out or something, you know, it would have been solved in 30 years. I don't understand why we've had one, so much money with no results, and number two, why there hasn't been a more organized, effort to address some of these things in a more valuable way. I think we've wasted a lot of money and a lot of time and certainly have learned some things and you know you always learn some things but we don't have any decisions and when I look at other parts of agriculture those other parts of agriculture would have had better results, better decisions made than we have had. So what it looks like in a hundred years, my guess is, you know, our grandchildren will be sitting here and they're going to be talking about varroa mites. <laughs> um, just because, which is kind of, kind of depressing. Um, but I hope that each and every one of you doesn't lose interest, uh, get discouraged, um, because keeping bees is, is harder than it's ever been. But for me, having been in it so long, I still wake up every morning and think, isn't this cool? Um, isn't this amazing? This relationship that you can have with a bug, uh, they're inviting you into their home. Everybody else in the world is an entomophobe, afraid of insects. But we get to enter an insect's world um, in a way that many others can't appreciate or understand why we do it. But without honeybees and without other pollinators, um, our lives would change dramatically and our environment would change dramatically. And I, so I think that you and honeybees and what you do is so key to the success of this earth. And it, that may sound overblown, but, but what we need to do is, is figure out sustainability, which means how do we produce enough food to eat without destroying the earth? And, and so that all comes back to this relationship between this pollinator and plants. And you are all a part of it now, whether you want to be or not. And I appreciate each and every one of you being here and uh, allowing me to share some time with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.